very honored uh, to be here to um, discuss this very important issue with everybody today. If there is one thing that you remember from today's presentations, I hope it's that you remember this. This video shows a rupture of a buried, dense phase carbon dioxide pipeline. The experiment was conducted in the safe environment of the DMVGL spade out of testing and research centre to assess the consequences of such ruptures in terms of mass outflow, crater formation and dense gas dispersion. The viewer should note that the extent of the visible plume does not necessarily represent the extent of the dense gas hazard. this video probably dozens of times. This is a test rupture of an eight inch pipeline, of C a CO2 pipeline. When I watch this video, I think about my home in Louisiana, which is another part of the United States where regulators and companies are talking about bringing these CO2 pipelines close to where people live. Um, and this is all done as part of, as you know, the, um, the nation's efforts to move toward a system of carbon capture and storage. But what is carbon capture and storage? I'm sure that you have heard um, a lot about this before. Carbon capture and storage, of course, is the <clears throat> theory that uh, carbon emissions from coal and gas-fired power plants or other industrial polluting facilities can be captured before they're released into the atmosphere and then can be stored underground indefinitely or more often used to get more oil and gas out of the ground through what is called enhanced oil recovery. You might actually recognize carbon capture and storage by another marketing monitor that moniker that it had for decades, which is clean coal. This is not a new technology. It's something that the oil, gas, and coal industries have been proposing and working to get public money for, for many decades. And after decades of research and, and uh, experimental application into some form of carbon capture, the flagship projects for this technology have failed. In the last few years, because carbon capture is just not feasible or economical, billions of dollars of the public's money have been spent and it is still not working. Less than a tenth of 1%, less than 0.10% of carbon emissions are being captured right now. And feasibly less than 8% of carbon emissions could even be captured if carbon capture and storage is built out in the way that the industry is pushing for. We're talking about potentially trillions of dollars of public money for less than 10% of a solution that endangers communities. And that's if this technology even works. Some project proponents are proposing carbon capture and storage plans, which would affect Minnesota, including a series, a system of pipelines. <clears throat> and that actually includes potentially the largest carbon capture and storage project in the world that would cost billions of dollars with the capacity to capture eight to 12 million tons of CO2 per year. To, that sounds like a lot, millions of tons, but to put that number in perspective, that's only about a 10th of Minnesota's annual emissions. And it's a drop in the bucket compared to the global CO2 emissions annually, which are 36.4 billion tons. That's a lot. <laughs> and what we're talking about is the largest CCS project in the world to address a tiny portion of those emissions. <clears throat> Proponents of carbon capture and storage actually envision a massive new network of CO2 pipelines across the country to transport this dangerous asphyxiant for either enhanced oil recovery in otherwise depleted wells or for storage in, in largely in underground saline aquifers. 
At present in the United States, there are about 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines, mostly concentrated in the gas and oil fields of West Texas and mostly used for EOR. And CCS proponents imagine expanding that to 25,000 miles by 2050 and shifting from remote fields to heavily populated areas throughout the country, including Minnesota. And at this point, I'm actually gonna hand it over um, to my colleague, June, who is going to talk about the differences between carbon capture and direct air capture technology um, and, and how both of them actually require the transportation of CO2 from the capture site to the injection site via pipeline. Um, this network of uh, 25,000 miles of pipeline um, that is planned to be um, built out and installed in the United States uh, by 2050 is on top of an existing network of pipelines. That build out for CO2 pipelines is completely unrealistic. The scientists touting this as a solution expect us to build more infrastructure to move CO2 than we've built to move oil and gas in the last 100 years. And they expect that to be built out in the next 20 years. Existing natural gas pipelines on top of that can't easily just be converted. They can't be converted into CO2 pipelines. And Nikki's gonna go into that in a bit more detail um, in just a minute because CO2 has to be moved at extremely high temperature and extremely, I'm sorry, extremely low temperature and extremely high pressure, which means the pipelines need to be thicker and they need to be able to withstand much more pressure and that extreme temperature differential than natural gas pipelines. So what we're talking about is not just a new, a couple of new pipelines, we're talking about a massive new network of pipelines on top of an existing massive network of pipelines just to be able to move CO, CO2 theoretically um, on the public dime. And with that, I'm now gonna um, pass the mic to Nikki and I will continue sharing my screen and um, she will take over the next few slides. So Nikki. Great, thank you very much, and I hope uh, you all can hear me well. Um, my name is Nikki Reich, and I work with Jane at the Center for International Environmental Law. Um, so as, as Jane was just saying, CO2 pipelines are not fossil fuel pipelines. They're not natural gas or oil pipelines. The qualities and characteristics of CO2 and the conditions under which it has to be transported pose unique risks. And these are risks that the current federal and most state regulatory frameworks do not yet address comprehensively. Even the White House's Council on Environmental Quality made these same observations about the fact that there are gaps in the existing regulatory framework at the federal level that need to be addressed. And there are certainly few states that have yet to um, uh, adapt their existing state laws and regulations to accommodate the unique risks. And what is it about CO2 that poses these unique risks. I mean, three of those factors highlighted here are that it is transported in a supercritical state, as has been said, which requires extremely high pressure. That high pressure requires thicker pipelines and different pipeline characteristics um, than those that are used for gas and oil, which is why it's not possible to simply um, convert existing pipeline networks or to assume that the criteria related to the siting of those existing pipelines would be adequate to address um, the, the risks posed by CO2 pipelines. And also crucially, and as we'll hear about more later, CO2 is an asphyxiant and can be fatal at high concentrations. So because there are so few successful CCS projects and so few CO2 pipelines currently operational, the regulatory frameworks are, are for protecting public health and safety and managing the substance are inadequate. And, and there are a lack of uh, studies to date. And, and one WHO expert in fact said that there, the exposure studies simply don't exist. And even industry uh, representatives recognize that given the, the relatively low number of pipelines, failure data is very limited. And so the cumulative experience to date has really impaired the evolution of the regulatory framework. Um, next slide, please. So liquid and uh, compressed CO2 is a hazardous substance, and we really can't stress enough, particularly at the volumes and pressures under discussion in the proposed CO2 pipeline projects here, it should be regulated as such consistent with the classification by the Department of Transportation, um, FEMSA, which lists and classifies um, the gaseous liquid and solid forms of carbon dioxide as hazardous. And unlike oil and gas, uh, the risk with transportation of CO2 at critical 
and supercritical pressures is not ignition, but asphyxiation. And you'll hear more about this among other impacts from Dr. Seingraber and, and also from Dan Ziegert, who will discuss uh, one of the known instances of a rupture. The, the spread of CO2 released from a pipeline can be really quite extensive because of the diameter of these pipelines and the immense pressure, as we saw in that uh, even controlled release video above and recognizing that that was in you know, controlled conditions outside of occupied or used uh, lands. Um, next slide, please. So what adds to the risk posed by CO2 ruptures or running fractures um, are, are that CO2 is a colorless, odorless gas that is denser than air. And so when there is a rupture and it is released, it accumulates in low-lying areas and, and doesn't dissipate quickly, posing a threat to uh, people, wildlife, you know, including first responders who may come to the area. And, it's, and it makes the topography a really important consideration in siting CO2 pipelines, because one needs to understand those uh, dynamics of how uh, a rupture or, or leak could, um, could play out. And you know, when, when these pipelines are sited in rural areas, the, it adds, you know, there, these features of CO2 add to the complexity of emergency response. And I'll talk about that in more in just a moment, but when CO2 is released at high concentrations, it not only can have health impacts, but it can actually prevent internal combustion engines from working, which makes evacuation very challenging. And it can make it hard for assistance and emergency help to reach the areas in, in some cases. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to, before we transfer on, I just wanted to you know, flag something that is often um, raised is that you know, CO2 is compared to, well, it's a, it's a harmless substance. We have it in our fizzy water and our carbonated drinks. But just to really underscore the point that's been made here, when we're talking about a massive pipeline network and system of this scale and volume and pressure, it is a, it is a completely different substance uh, that poses uh, a, range, a range of hazards. So uh, turning, turning to you know, other, other uh, dimensions of the CCS build out that, that could pose or propose CCS build out, I should say that, that complicate uh, and, and compound the risks of rupture and the health impacts are the potential presence of impurities in the pipeline. So CO2 might not be the only thing in a pipeline and the, the presence of impurities such as hydrogen uh, sulfide and sulfur dioxide uh, are, are particularly uh, issues when, when the CO2 stream is sourced from power and industrial plants, but there simply aren't enough studies to know whether the presence of those impurities is also an issue at, uh, at fertilizer plants, certainly, and at ethanol um, processing plants as well. It certainly could be. And water, in fact, the presence of water is one of the chief causes of corrosion in pipelines. Um, and as the federal government, uh, as the federal uh, government has recognized in the CUQ's report, federal pipeline safety regulations don't include standards uh, for CO2 composition or purity. So this is a big uh, gap in the existing regulatory framework and there just isn't information about those impurities to answer the question. So this is a key issue for regulators thinking through, um, are these concerns being sufficiently addressed under existing regulations and what guarantees are provided by proponents of, of these projects? Um, next slide, please. So, what role for state regulators uh, with respect to these risks and concerns? There are a number of different ways in which uh, states are called upon to act to protect, uh, to protect public health, to protect the environment, and, and to ensure the enforcement and oversight of safety. So while pipeline safety um, is regulated under uh, DOT, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration Authority, that has set out uh, different regulations for interstate CO2 pipelines, there is a clear role for the state government, not only in overseeing pipeline siting, including zoning issues, setbacks, and, and the environmental impacts of pipeline, both uh, impacts on surface and subsurface waters in terms of their location and the potential uh, effects of risk, but also in terms of the pipeline permitting processes, the involvement uh, of local government authorities and public participation, and crucially uh, determining what purposes, for what purposes a CO2 pipeline uh, developer may use eminent domain, if at all, to secure land and rights of way for, for CO2 pipelines. With respect to pipeline safety, as I said, uh, you know, enforcement of the minimum safety standards by DOT uh, that DOT has set may fall on state authorities. And, and states like Minnesota can enact more stringent standards pursuant to certification if they have that certification um, from DOT, which I believe Minnesota 
has for uh, natural gas pipelines. Two other crucial areas of regulation to have on the radar and to really think through the adequacy of existing regulations are, as I mentioned, with respect to first responder preparedness, both the resources and funds to respond and the training uh, necessary to do so, which does not exist in most locations and also modes for participation by local governments and the public. And we'll note here that an issue that arises uh, many times is the adequacy of disclosures about plans regarding projects and their, and their locations and risks with affected communities. And critically in Minnesota, where there are populations of, of Native Americans and, and indigenous populations, they need to be at the table and crucially consulted on discussions about CCS pipeline uh, siting. And uh, as, we, as we know, has been an issue in many um, and many pipeline uh, debates. So just to be clear that uh, the federal government does not have authority over the siting of interstate CO2 pipelines across federal and non-federal lands. So states really are in the driver's seat in terms of establishing regulatory frameworks within their state boundaries, which include responsibility, as I said, for siting uh, and permitting those pipelines, as well as segments of uh, interstate hazardous pipelines that are within uh, those boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we're, we're getting towards uh, we're, we're getting towards the end here. Um, so one of the crucial questions that, that regulations need to consider in establishing uh, appropriate setback distances um, from uh, occupied areas and in buffer zones. And the criteria used for oil and gas pipelines cannot simply be transposed for the reasons we discussed above without um, without tailored analysis. As, as I think will become clear from the example that, um, from the safety video we saw at the beginning, uh, and as from the example of, of the leak in, in Mississippi, ductile running fractures are a primary concern. And so engineering specifications and safety standards are critical to ensure that the pipelines being used um, meet the appropriate tests uh, and have uh, the appropriate ability to withstand the high pressures and, and, and enough checkpoints to, to respond with safety valves. Preventing public safety is really um, a critical issue. And this is going to grow uh, in importance as the plans for build out affect more and more populous areas. So we're no longer talking about pipelines merely in oil and gas uh, uh, exploitation zones. We're talking about pipelines that run in through areas with, with small towns and even close to big cities. Next slide, please. Um, there, you know, if the CO2 uh, moving, um, if, it, excuse me, um, uh, I think, we'll, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide, please, sorry. Um, because uh, the current, you know, it might be the case that current CCS proposals are only involving uh, pipelines running through Minnesota, it's important that regulators consider other aspects of the CCS process beyond transportation, because with the pressure to build out carbon capture and storage uh, across the country, those other dimensions of the carbon capture and storage process may well affect the state. And that includes upstream issues around the capture process, as well as downstream issues around injection and storage. And as June uh, addressed a, a bit ago, the solvents used in the chemical capture process uh, need to be regulated, both their use, transportation, and, and disposal. And the CEQ, uh, again, the Council on Environmental Quality, uh, has mentioned that there has been insufficient study and regulation uh, with regard to the effects of the use of those chemicals on air pollutants and air quality in the vicinity of industrial facilities equipped with capture. So that is another dimension that, that uh, remains under, uh, understudied and under-regulated uh, at the federal level existing um, and also is important for, um, for areas in non-attainment. With regard to injection and, and storage, the, the downstream use of, of the carbon that may be transported through these pipelines, there's, there's a lot of risk with respect to the siting of pipelines, uh, excuse me, the injection of pipeline, uh, pipeline contents into pro in proximity to uh, oil and gas wells or depleted uh, wells. There are lots of risks that doing so, as has been discussed for the destination of pipelines coming from Minnesota into North Dakota, um, even if the proponents disclaim enhanced oil recovery as an objective, there is concern that injecting uh, CO2 in areas of depleted oil and gas could uh, raise uh, issues of affecting the pressure, contamination and leakage, and even um, generating concerns about produced water, which can be radioactive and can require other hazardous management. 
There's a whole other slew of issues that um, are not currently adequately regulated with regard to ensuring the permanence of storage. Um, there's a lot of promises made that, that the CO2 injected would be stored for millions of years, but the studies just aren't there to prove that that is possible. Um, and there are a lot of concerns about the adequacy of uh, monitoring and oversight, particularly when we've seen some states adopt regulations that transfer ownership and with it uh, disclaim liability for oversight and monitoring of injection sites after as little as 10 years um, in, some, in some cases. So we wanted to just bring some of these issues uh, to your attention as you're thinking through um, the, the risks posed by these proposals and the adequacy of existing regulations at the state and federal level to really prevent environmental and health uh, disasters. I'll turn it back to you, Jane. Thanks, Nikki. And we just wanted to close out um, this presentation by pointing out uh, we understand that there have been uh, reassurances given to the people of Minnesota that the carbon that is passing through the state will not be used for enhanced oil recovery. But we just want to reiterate that the over 80% of the CO2 that is captured in the United States is used for enhanced oil recovery. And globally, that number is, it's, uh, other, study, other studies suggest that it's actually over 90% of CO2 collected globally is used for enhanced oil recovery. And the climate justifications for capturing CO2 as any kind of a climate solution depend on the reality of sequestration, permanent sequestration. Um, if there is any possibility that it might leak out at any point in the future, that obviously releases the CO2 into the atmosphere, which is exactly what this technology is meant to avoid. And, and frankly, any justification for CCS evaporates completely if that CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery. And if the pipelines moving through Minnesota or other states are funded through state or federal climate subsidies, as is often the case, and we understand is the case with some projects coming up in Minnesota, the use of that CO2 for um, enhanced oil recovery could actually jeopardize those subsidies. And if the eventual in injection sites for the CO2 that is moving through Minnesota pipelines are very near existing oil and gas wells, um, we certainly recommend that regulators should be fully investigating what the CO2 will be used for, um, whether it will actually be permanently sequestered, and what guarantees there are that, that, that those storage sites are safe and permanent, as has been claimed.